My title is entitled Hepatitis Delta. What are the new developments and what are the challenges? This is my disclosures. I'm sorry, I have to get rid of this. So I will mention challenges and the new developments, not in a particular order. You will see that uh, they will come uh, during the presentation. But most of the new developments, of course, are due uh, in, in relation to treatment, and I will mention them. Okay. Now, let's start with the epidemiology, because there is new data here. The global delta hepatitis prevalence is estimated to be 5% of patients who have active HPV infection. And we know that in the US and in Western Europe, delta hepatitis is, is, has been designated orphan disease status. Now, there is a new study, as I mentioned, from researchers from the Far East who looked at the prevalence and burden of hepatitis D on a global scale. They did a system, systematic review and meta-analysis, and their conclusion is the following. They found that approximately 10.5% of surface antigen carriers, and this is without IV drug use and without people who have high-risk sexual behavior, were co-infected with HDV. So this is about twofold of what has been estimated before. Of course, they also noted that a substantially higher proportion was seen in the IV drug user population and people who have with high-risk sexual behavior, and they suggest, they recommend uh, to have an increased focus on the routine HDV screening and also uh, highlight the importance of HPV vaccination. Now, another important area in, in terms of epidemi epidemiology is that, first of all, don't forget, delta hepatitis epidemiology, you need hepatitis B to have delta hepatitis, but delta hepatitis epidemiology does not follow hepatitis B epidemiology. In hepatitis B, China and Sub-Saharan Africa were important contributors. How is it in Delta? Now, this study is a recent paper on which looks, again, a systemic review and meta-analysis of Delta virus infection in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what they found, they looked at 374 studies and uh, eliminated most of them, and this study is based on three, 30 studies. And what they found was, in West Africa, the pooled setup prevalence of hepatitis D was 7.3% in the general population and 9.6% in liver disease populations. In Central Africa, setup prevalence was 25.6% in the general population and 37, 38% in liver disease population. In East and South, Southern Africa, on the other hand, Delta practically does not exist. So again, here we have another hot spot of Delta infection uh, on, uh, in Africa. Central and West Africa are important. Now, in addition, they also looked at uh, published genotypes in Africa. What we, have, what we expect, of course, is that you see African genotypes, genotype 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now, what is important is if you look in this cartoon, you see that these geno African genotypes exist, but they represent the minority in African genotypes in, in Africa. This is important because there are some emerging data that the African genotypes, especially genotype 5, may have a better prognosis compared to genotype 1, and that genotype, African genotypes may respond better to interferon than genotype 1. So th this is fine, but it, it shows that, this map shows that the majority, the, that the vast majority of gen uh, delta hepatitis in Africa are actually due to hepatitis B, hepatitis 1, I'm sorry, genotype 1, and the African genotypes represent a tiny or a bigger minority. Now, in terms of the uh, estimation of delta prevalence in, in, on a global scale, especially in Western countries, we look at the total HDV population as the 
population of high risk group plus the low risk, the addition of that. And we look at the surface enzyme positive high risk groups, which are immigrants and IV drug user population. And as you can see, in countries like Sweden, Spain, and France, they represent 85 to 95% of the total uh, Delta population are, the, are confined to these high risk groups. This is not only the case in Western Europe, but also in, in the Far East. This is a paper from, China, from, from Taiwan, which shows that in, among hepatitis B patients of different uh, status, Delta is very infrequent, but in the IV drug users, you have a, a substantial increase in Delta prevalence. This is uh, especially more evident in IV drug users who are also who also have HIV. Now, China. In China, Delta is not a problem. This is shown here: Delta prevalence among surface enzyme positive patients without risk factors. The yellow color is for China. You can see it here. Okay, I'm very fancy this. And this is 5 to 10 percent, which is low uh, endemicity. But if you, look, if you look at the IV drug user population, things change, and you have a very high proportion of uh, delta prevalence in, among, delta, uh, among, IG, uh, uh, among IV drug users. Now, what is the meaning of this? The meaning is that if you look at the global estimation of HDV in the general population, numerically, China contributes to the most to the general delta hepatitis pool on a global scale, close to 1.5 million delta hepatitis patients in China. And in China, I'm sure nobody would consider delta a problem. Compared to Mongo if you compare it to Mongolia, it's peanuts, 20, close to 3,000. And in Mongolia, you have a very high prevalence of delta hepatitis. Now, these sort of studies, which look at huge uh, published material, you have to be careful with uh, looking at all this. I mean, all the data may not be correct. If, if you look here, in Turkey, you have a almost 80,000 people with delta hepatitis compared to, compared to that, that to France, it's 65,000. And if you look at the population of France and Turkey, it's basically similar. Does that mean in France you have the same magnitude of problem of in, in terms of delta hepatitis as in Turkey? I don't think so. Now, the other thing is, look, Italy, 60,000, and then look at Romania, 20,000. The population of the population of Romania is, or of Italy, is three times the population of Romania. So 20 million versus 60 million. So again, it, it means that in Romania, Delta hepatitis is not a problem. It's similar to Italy, which where Delta hepatitis is, is there were reports if Delta hepatitis is vanishing. So, uh, so these studies have fancy statistics, fancy methodology, but may not be always true because they are based on data which, where you have to, to look at the quality and, and sometimes they make the error of looking at huge population screen for hepatitis B or, or, or Delta. Uh, and this is, these are blood donors and this is the wrong population to look at, for example. So the resume is that you should order anti-HTV tests in every surface enzyme positive, even if you look, live in a country like Sweden or China. At the very least, order anti-HTV tests if surface enzyme is positive, ALT high, DNA is low, and the patient you, you would uh, tend it to be to think of non steatohepatitis hepatitis or the patient does not respond to nucleosidal treatment. Now, I know that some people are bored, sick and tired of checking for anti-HDV tests because it always come back as negative. I have to say, I'm practicing liver disease for the last 30 years. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is very rare in Turkey. 
but in every single patient with chronic hepat I mean ALT elevation, I check for alpha one antitrypsin. It's just it's a simple test, uh, cheap, so there should be no problem to, to to look for delta. Because if you look for for example, this is just one study. Uh, in HIV pop in the HIV population, this is delta, and this is the patients who die most from uh, in the HIV population. Here you have hepatitis C, either not treated <clears throat> or not responding to peglet interferon ribavirin, and consider that you have now direct acting antivirals. So, the main trigger of death in in the HIV population who get antiretroviral treatment is basically if they are co-infected with Delta. It shows how important the problem of Delta hepatitis is despite its rarity. Now treatment of Delta hepatitis is very simple. It's with interferon and therefore it is very difficult. The difficulty is that you have only one treatment and I will mention that Sometimes you need prolonged courses of interferon treatment. Now, HCC in chronic hepatitis B versus delta hepatitis, you see more HCC in delta hepatitis. However, if you look at those patients who responded to treatment in delta hepatitis, the difference in terms of HCC incidence goes away. Therefore, it is important to treat delta hepatitis in a right way, but to treat Delta hepatitis in the right way is again, as I said, quite difficult. The problem is, if you look at surface, I mean, first of all, I mixed up some slides, but there, there are many in vitro data where, which have shown that uh, in cell culture studies, interferons were not effective in, re, in re inhibiting replication of delta virus. Or jack sat pathway, it was not affected by interferon treatment in uh, cell lines infected with delta plates. This is a study, a, a viral kinetic study in humans, which shows that the first, there is a first phase of the, uh, delta virus RNA decline under interferon treatment, shown here. I'm sorry. Yes, this is HDV RNA, this is surface antigen. This is the first phase, and then there is a slower phase of decline. But if you look at the time frame, we're speaking about months, and what, we, what they have found is that there is a long delay before PEG interferon affects HDV RNA levels. And this is a median of 8.5 days. In HPV or in HCV, effect of interferon on DNA or HCV RNA is eight to 10 hours, it's, so it's, we were speaking about hours, and this is 8.5 days. So therefore, treating hepatitis delta with interferon is not as easy. The problem is, in, in a co-infection, you have always the dominant virus, and it is most of the time is D. Sometimes you have both are dominant, or none of them are dominant. And the rare cases you have where hepatitis B is dominant. But overall, delta hepatitis is a disease of the delta virus. Now, uh, the, the, the largest study performed in delta hepatitis is the HEDI2 study. And this is close to publishing. But uh, there was, we looked at the viral dominance pattern in the HEDI2 study, and basically, Patients who had more than one log increase compared to HPV or the other way around were considered, if, if the one more increase was due to D, it was D dominant. If HPV DNA was higher, more than one log higher compared to Delta, this was considered B dominant. And overall, 75% were D dominant, 7% were B dominant, and 70% were there was no dominance or we, we can speak also about co-dominant pattern. Now, the important thing is, if we looked at the response speed, the, the pace of response to interferon treatment, in D-dominant cases, this is in the middle, 
the response to interferon at 12 weeks HDV under negativity was the least compared to HPV, H, HPV dominant or co-dominant cases. So it, this shows that it, with interferon you have, you may need prolonged courses of treatment. And okay, this is the slide I mentioned. And there's also recent data which has shown that uh, in, 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 hep, uh, hep, uh, in in vitro cell lines for hepatitis B infection, uh, cell lines which are infected with Delta virus show an increase in, in uh, show a response to inter, uh, interferon alpha, interferon beta, interferon lambda responses, but exogenous interferon do not affect HDV, do not appear to affect HDV RNA levels. So overall, we have a problem with interferon treatment in delta hepatitis. And the optimal dose of duration of interferon treatment has to be assessed on an individual basis. And in, in our database, we had patients who, re who received, who had entered a uh, response, uh, HDV clearance after a cumulative duration of treatment of 10 years. There was, after a cumulative duration of five years, the response rate increased to more than 50%. But this is, of course, there's some selection bias in, in, involved in this because patients who somehow responded tended to have to accept con continued interferon treatment. So, but overall, interferon treatment is difficult. And we need new treatments, and new treatments are on the horizon. We have entry inhibitors, prenylation inhibitors, and nucleic acid polymers. These are the, the most important three ones. Now, in terms of new treatment options, it is important that we have good surrogate markers. Now, there is no ideal surrogate markers in delta hepatitis treatment, and we came together, several uh, authors, to suggest, recommend uh, 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 endpoint, surrogate endpoint in HDV treatment for these new treatment <coughs> regimens. And we recommended that end of treatment, more than two log decline of HDV RNA should be accepted as a surrogate marker of initial treatment efficacy. Because none of the, I mean, none of these new treatments are optimal treatments. We are, we're not talking about the perfectovir. We are talking about the suboptimal treatment, but in a, in a disease which has detrimental consequences and where the only treatment is interferon, we have to, pa we have to open an avenue for new treatments to arrive for the, for the sake of the patients. So what are the characteristics of novel drug, drug treatment in HDV? The one is Mirkludex, which interferes with entry into hepatocyte. It is given as subcutaneous injections daily for six months, but it, it may be considered also for prolonged treatments. Lonafarnap is the prenylation inhibitor. It inhibits farnesyl transferase and inhib uh, therefore inhibits virion assembly. There is an oral formulation, and so far, two, up to 12 months of lonafarnap has been given to patients. And finally, there is the nucleic acid polymers, which uh, apparently inhibit extrusion of, delta of the delta virion from the hepatocyte. Its mood of action is not quite understood, but this is what it is suggested. It is given as intravenous inf infusion once every week. Now, let's start with Mirkludex, some data. Mirkludex B led to a 1.7 log decline at the dose of 2 milligrams per kilogram in the first study published. And with interferon combination, the decrease of HDV RNA was 2.6 log, and they spoke about synergistic efficacy. In the phase two study, which has been presented at the last EASL meeting, they did a dose escalation study, and the higher the dose, two, five, and 10 milligrams uh, of Mirkludex, it appeared that higher doses were more effective and this effect also is reflected by ALT normalization. But overall, Mirkulidex appears to be uh, effective at higher doses and also more effective when combined with peglet interferon. And the good thing about Mirkulidex is that 
it apparently does not have important side effects. Prenation in vitro lonafarnib, in the study we did, we showed that <coughs> combination of prenation of lonafarnib with pegylid interferon or ritonavir is better than monotherapy with lonafarnib. And there is also the possibility that once you stop treatment, you may have a flare, a biological and biochemical flare, which ends up with ALT normalization and HDVRNA negativity in some patients. But overall, again, what has been found is that combination with piglet interferon has a synergistic effect. Shown here is the mean values of 25 milligrams, triple uh, milligram lonafarnib with ritonavir, very modest effect, but with triple therapy with interferon, you have a striking synergistic effect. What about nucleic acid polymers? They appear to have the most striking efficacy data. Uh, they have been given as monotherapy for 16 weeks and then combination for another 16 weeks with interferon and then another course with piglet interferon monotherapy. And three year follow up study data have been presented and basically HDV RNA negativity was seen in seven out of 12 patients three years post-treatment. Surface antigen negativity in five out of 12. So this is a regimen which, forget about delta, if this is true, could be considered for hepatitis B treatment as well. But as a, again, as I said, it is, uh, the m one thing is that you have to give it as intravenous infusion. Now, reported side effects, Mirkudex, not much. So with Mirkudex, you can consider it for advanced liver disease, probably. You can consider long-term treatment beyond six months, beyond even one year. Lonafarnib, those limiting side eff effects are gastrointestinal toxicity, anorexia, diarrhea, weight loss. The doses which combine best efficacy and, and uh, tolerance have been more or less uh, found based on phase two studies, and uh, uh, they will go ahead with, with the phase three study. Nucleic acid polymers. Studies have been done in Bangladesh and Moldova. They report side effects such as hair loss, dysphagia, anorexia, and dysgeusia. And in one study, they s s related these side effects to heavy metal exposure at the trial site, which is a little bit bizarre. So they have to, have to, do, to do further studies with uh, nucleic acid polymers. So overall, in summary, in terms of new drugs, registration studies expect to start soon for Mirkludex and Lonafarnib. I'm, I'm speaking about early months of 2019. Nucleic acid polymers, they are considering to, to find a subcutane formula adaptation and do a small pilot study with the subcutaneous formulation and then uh, are considering to do registration studies. There are other studies. Of course, there are other medications which are uh, assessed. And of course, functional cure for HPV would be also helpful for delta hepatitis. So in summary, the only effective for delta hepatitis uh, the, the only effective treatment of delta hepatitis is, is currently with interferons. Treatment beyond one year is needed in a sizable proportion of patients. New drugs promising PEG interferon with these new drugs may still be used as backbone. And so we are expecting to enter new era in the management of delta hepatitis. However, realistic approach on a global scale suggests a cascade approach in Africa and maybe in China the most reasonable approach should be you know, HPV vaccination with special emphasis on the birth dose. Thank you.